So let me introduce Hong uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, she's the founder of FOSS Asia, which is an organization that tries to improve people's lives by sharing open technologies and by fostering global communications and sustainable production. She is an executive board member of the Open Source Business Alliance and a vice chair of the Open Source Committee under the IEEE Standards Association. She works with companies on their transition to open source and their transition to inner source development models. And she's also worked on bringing open source hardware into production at scale. That's pretty exciting. So I have, uh, there are a couple of questions from the larger Aperio community about open source hardware. So I'll make sure to, to pose those when we get to the question and answer period. So with that said, Hong, let me turn this over to you. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you this afternoon, this evening, this morning. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for the introduction. Um, yes, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Aperio Foundation for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, so um, today um, I'm going to share with you like my personal story, how open source impacted my education and uh, created opportunities for myself and many students I know from our network in Asia. Um, after that, I will speak a little bit about how Force Asia has been fostering open source in ed education through um, its activities and partnership with um, institu institutions around Asia. Okay, so um, let's get started. What you see here on the screen is a map of uh, Vietnam, the country where I came from. I grew up in Vietnam from this um, city at the very bottom of, of the country from the south. You see here the, the red uh, arrow. The city is called Kanto. It's about 100 kilometers from, from, from Ho Chi Minh City, which is uh, the biggest city in Vietnam. Um, Vietnam, like you probably know, it's one of a very few communist countries that still exist today. One party, one party holds all the power. Of course, there are many problems that we are facing like today. For example, corruption is the biggest issue people always talk about on the media. Inequality, poverty, healthcare, and of course, education. Many of these problems are caused by the lack of uh, knowledge, the lack of resources, the lack of access to information and tools. Today, um, session, I will talk only about education problems. What of problems? Uh, what kind of problem? What kinds of challenges that we face in country like Vietnam? I want to talk about um, two challenges, the education quality and the cost of education. These are a few pictures from, from the past and I thought that it would be nice for you um, to, to see like, another part of the world while I listen to my story. Um, on the left hand side, picture of myself during my school year, my parents, my sister, and on the right hand side um, um, is the area where I came from. The street that you see at the bottom right is the street where my where my home is still today. Yeah. Um, many Vietnamese people of my um, generation and also myself, when we were in school, we learned what the party wanted us and allowed us to learn. The internet was not very accessible 20 years ago when I was in school. Very few families could afford to have a computer. Foreign language like English was a subject for more like well-off people. Universities back then and also now open for, 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 for anyone, for everyone who could pass the admission exams. Even though anyone can take the admission exam in order to pass the exam, uh, students often have to pay for extra classes and these cost a lot of money. So not, not everyone could afford to go to university. 
especially like famous university in major cities like Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi. Because after you enter university, you still have to think of how to um, cover your uh, cost of living in, in big cities. Yeah. And um, uh, beside the, the cost of education, there was a lot of um, unfair treatment among the students of different backgrounds. And I believe that is still like happening today. I, um, I remember when I was in school, like some of the students were favored by the teachers and they, um, they, um, they got selected to participate in art and performance courses. And these are very special, um, only reserved a few places for people um, come from very good background. It depends on their family status. So I didn't get to, to participate in these uh, like performance or art lessons. But I was very lucky that my parents uh, did whatever they could so that I can, uh, I and my sister could have a good education. So I got to learn English as well when I was um, younger. Um, I remember my parents that you can see here in, in, in the photo, they worked super, super hard for 16 hours per day yeah, to, um, uh, to make a living and to take care of, uh, of, uh, of their children. However, it was very often that um, we struggling with um, with money in the house, and there was one um, like um, uh, one year. I want to uh, to tell this um, story. Maybe it also happened elsewhere in other countries. There was um, a teacher day. I don't know if you celebrate like elsewhere teachers day. So in Vietnam, there was a norm that on this day, parents um, parents are supposed to send present to to the teachers. And there was uh, that year, my mom bought a bag of sugar and and two and two cans of condensed milk so that I can I could bring to uh, to class to give to my teacher with the hope that um, she would taking care of me um, and um, look after me in, in class. And I was so shy uh, because when I came in, all the other students brought in like very nice uh, piece of fabrics, and this is something that. It's usual for people come from like um, more well off family. So um, and um, because it's like thing like this, I didn't really like the fact that I have to to brought something. And from a very young age, I has a strong desire for eco opportunities. I want to um, to have a better life for myself and also for my family. I studied very, very hard, uh, worked very hard, and almost never had time for any fun activities when I was a kid. But still, I was never really sure that things would work out for me when I grew up. Until one day, I discovered um, the free and open source movement. I got really inspired by the communities of like-minded individuals working together openly freely sharing ideas and solutions for the benefits of everyone. So um, shortly after I joined the community, I, stuck, um, I started to, to benefit from the knowledge that I gained. I met so many talented people who show me endless learning opportunities and opened up a, <laughs> my like, horizon. My life shifted to a positive and more promising direction. Um, that got me very excited because I did not see the way to achieve what I want for me and my family, but also I recognize um, the possibility to tackle issues for more people in our society by adopting the open source way of learning. So um, open source impacted my education. I learned so much outside of the classroom. It changed the way I worked. It changed my life and brought me where I am today. So um, today I am in a very comfortable position that allows me to do the things that I love, um, that allows me to choose where I want to live, how, how I want to live my life. And um, 
I as as I saw open source can make an impact for me. In um, two thousand and uh, and nine, I co-founded um, the Vault Asia organization uh, with the goal to introduce the free and open source concept to more people in developing countries, and most importantly, to empower people to turn their ideas into reality and make things also possible for them. So um, the mission of, of, of Force Asia is that George uh, mentioned earlier, improve people's uh, lives by sharing open technologies, knowledge, resources, and building sustainable force ecosystem. At Force Asia, we put a strong focus on um, education because um, we believe education is the key factor for success. The foundation that helps us to progress further. And uh, education in the open source way means we not only learn, but at the same time, we share our knowledge with others, everyone, so everyone can benefit from it. For many years, Force Asia has been fostering open source in education from bottom up. What does it mean? We um, identify advocates in our network who are willing to work um, with us to bring open source topics to um, academic sector. These are dedicated teachers, lecturers, professors who share our vision and uh, who believe in the value of open source. The individuals, they want nothing but the best for their students. Yeah, and uh, over the years, we organize um, a lot of presentations, workshops on campus with the support of these individuals, uh, the advocates. Uh, we collaborate with them on training programs um, that bring more um, ideas and like open source topics to, uh, to school universities. On the other hand, um, we also try to start the conversations on the ministry level. So we talk a lot with um, the Ministry of Education, not only in Vietnam, but um, other countries as well in the region. However, as you know, it always takes a longer time until something changed uh, from the top. So um, at the moment, bottom up approach is still um, the way we want to continue to pursue when it comes to bringing um, open source to education. Uh, I want to, um, to share another story with you, um, another successful example that proves the power of open source in the education. Um, back in 2012, I met a student that you can see here on the picture. His name uh, is Heng Nguyen. Um, he came from a third tier college. What is third tier? Third tier uh, means it was not a very good school. Most of the students there came from the countryside who couldn't manage to pass the university ad admission exam. Yeah, and uh, it's often very challenging to get a job after uh, their study for these students. And it's the same thing happening today. If you're not coming from a famous university, it's really hard for you to uh, to get a good job afterward. Yeah, and um, I was very surprised on that day that um, this boy had an open source operating system on his laptop, he was using Fedora at that time. Yeah, among like the group of a lot of like more elite students, he was the only one who used an open source OS. So I invited him to join our companies as an intern while he was still a student. Um, he didn't speak any English in the beginning, um, but we put him on an open source project where he had. A, where he had a chance to work with international um, contributors, teammates, connect with people on the same project. And after two years, he um, 
became a very good developer with a good command of English. And uh, we also brought him to the GNOME Asia Summit in Hong Kong as an award for his work and his contribution to the project. And um, this was the first time ever he traveled abroad. So you can see here in the picture, there was a picture taken at GNOME Asia and hung together with um, like the, um, the background taken in, in Hong Kong um, Central District. Yeah. And uh, another picture was taken like just a few years ago when we met again at another event organized by Force Asia. So this person Hung moved on to be a mentor, a contributor of Force Asia for a couple of years. And right now he has um, a very successful career in tech, leading an international engineering team in Vietnam. This story showed that open source did create opportunities for underprivileged group of people who didn't have a very good background. Um, to continue, I would like to, to highlight a few other programs and initiatives um, that Force Asia um, uh, organized in order to foster um, uh, open source more in education. Code Heat um, is an annual online coding program started in 2016 um, where we get thousands of participants learn how to code and how to contribute to open source projects. Um, active contributors in this contest like receive certificates um, for their participation and um, the winners can even get a financial reward. We, um, beside this contest at Force Asia, we also organize all kinds of hands-on activities like running hackathons, workshops at school, university, um, to teach people how to code, how to contribute to open source, how to work with different like open source solution and technology. This is more picture taken from um, from our like um, workshop and events. Um, these are a few projects that are coming out of um, the Force Asia community. Um, many of them um, uh, were developed by by students in our network. I'm not going to go through every single project, but today I want to introduce quickly this um, open hardware project, um, Pocket Science Lab. So this is um, a complete open source hard hardware device that used to help people to learn electronics. And um, what can you do with this device? So it it comes with all kinds of functionalities, oscilloscope, multimeter, logic analyzer, wave generator, power source, many things on one device. So what is so special about this device? Because this sensor, you can actually get it very easily these days. So the special thing about the device is it makes for, for education. So when you use the device, uh, you can measure all kinds of um, environmental, uh, all kinds of data. However, it's about how people make that device. So all the schematics, the hardware, completely open source. So people can not only learn how to use, but how to create the, their own device themselves. So we, we develop the software that run on, on the device. We develop the firmware and we work together with um, university and, and school to bring this into um, education, into the classroom that enable more people to learn, to make things easier for them to learn electronics. And you know that the entire world uh, is powered by, by electronics. And we think that this is a very um, important project. So it proved that um, it's possible to, to make things happen with open source technology. Yeah, so this is um, like a recap of the previous activity where we um, brought the pocket science lab, um, I mean, to, um, uh, to university and have students hacked uh, together the device. 
Another initiative that I want to um, introduce to you today is uh, building blogs.he. This is an outreach program uh, for students uh, organized by a group of students in Singapore with the aim to promote computing. Um, so uh, Mr. Gri Song Chi, their teacher in charge is a force Asia mentor and an advocate for open source in education. Um, he was the one who supported the formation of the group in 2017. And since then, this group, Building Blocks, um, has been collaborating with Force Asia to conduct several out of classroom workshops, trainings for hundreds of students across Singapore. And this is just uh, to showcase some of their um, activities. Another um, um, program or activity that I would like to introduce to you, which is the annual Force Asia Summit. This is our flagship conference established in 2009. It is um, a platform that brings together um, Institute of Higher Learning and open source community uh, to exchange ideas to collaborate on future projects. And um, yes, so um, this year, the, the summit will, will take place is, um, in April between 13 and 15, again, in Singapore. And we already like, have many education partners on board, um, for instance, NUS um, and, and National University of Singapore, um, um, Singapore Polytechnic, um, ITE is another uh, school in Singapore and uh, also collaborate uh, with the um, Skill Future Singapore. And this is an organization that focus strongly on higher education. We already like make plan with them to, um, to deliver like courses on open source on the uh, national wide level went um, into their like, uh, national skill future, skill future higher education program. And this is something, uh, a very good uh, news for, for us. And, and, and we are really looking forward to, to kick off this uh, collaboration with uh, Skill Future Singapore. Connect and collaborate with Force Asia. Yes, so um, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to um, to connect with us, work with us, we've been around like for fourteen years already. Um, every day we're trying um, to do more to 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 contribute, and with our like um, limited resources, we be able to um, make an impact um, in the past few years, and we would like to continue our work. Um, if you find um, like our program activities interesting for you, uh, please um, join our community, help us to continue our work by becoming a member, join um, the Fox Asia Summit um, in April in Singapore, uh, sponsor our events, work with us, um, we do offer like um, a, work on like a consultant basis like provide strategy and helping uh, organization to organize hackathon do outreach activities and many more if you are interested in um, open source hardware you can check out the pocket science lab on our website at um, bslab.io and finally um, please uh, connect with me on linkedin on social media you can find me um, with HP um, Dang or, or, or my name Hong Fu Dang. Thank you very much for um, your attention. All right, thank you so much for telling your story. Um, Francois has a question in the chat. Um, I would love to start us off with a, uh, a question that takes a deeper dive into your very first experience with open source, and then we'll turn to Francois's question. So you, you mentioned that you discovered open source, you were inspired, it opened up your eyes, there was, it was a, a boost for your education, showed you some possibilities. 
I would love to hear a little bit more in detail about that first open source project that you encountered. What was that project? Uh, what was the role or what were the roles that you played in that project? And, uh, you know, how in more detail did it inspire you to enter onto the path that you're on right now? Yes. So um, I can tell a little bit about my story. So basically, this is how I encounter open source. So you know that in Vietnam, right? So we use a computer and normally we have the I copy version of Windows on our device. So it's a really normal practice back then. Yeah, I shouldn't say it in America, but it was a normal practice. And then um, I also got one of the old computer with a copy version of Windows. And it is like in that year for some for some reason, my computer didn't work anymore. And then a friend of mine in university, he had me to install Ubuntu. It was 2007. Yeah, it was 2007. So I had to in install Ubuntu to my device. And that was the first time I started to use um, uh, an OS, yeah, an open source uh, operating system. And I really like it because um, it seemed to be faster and it didn't show the, the the pop up update uh, notification all the time yeah and i also didn't have to to use like a virus uh, protection system or anything like this and i still remember at that time i used um open office there was the password was open office to create a cv yeah and i just realized that it was so good it was so easy to generate a bdf uh, from from open office at that time compared to Windows. And I thought, that, wow, this is so cool. This is like all the thing that I need uh, for, um, for my for my study. So I started to continue to use Ubuntu and I started to join the Linux user group, the local Linux user group. And they have, I think they have every Thursday a, a, a meeting where people come together like to install an OS or, or, or to teach you a little bit of, of programming. So I, I came to um, to the Linux user group and uh, I got so inspired by these people. Why do I got inspired? Because they spent, I remember one time, one uh, community member spent three hours showing me how to run some command line and explain to me um, how the computer works and, and where can I find more resources um, that I can continue to learn at home. And I was really like moved and appreciate that someone who spent so much time like teaching, like teaching me something without asking anything in return. Yeah, so I um, got really like hooked into it, and then at the time, but I continued to to join more activities. In the beginning, let me remember, so I did some um, translation for various uh, projects. I think it was also Firefox that I did some uh, like localization, and I also like Firefox also do some translation. I open open street map, so I also contribute in terms of like drawing the area where uh, of my city yeah and um, over the years I continue to to meet more people and what I learned is that they are talking so positive about about the project and about their contribution to the project you you meet like people who volunteer for the past like 15 20 years and still and are still very excited talking about their their work so this is something that that I find uh, inspiring. So and that keep me continue to engage in one thing that um, I remember, I think after being active in the community for about one, one or two years, then I got invited to um, the international conference to talk about like uh, open source development in this area of the world and it was the first time ever i got to uh, to travel to to europe yeah and uh, yeah so it's, and and from that uh, travel i met again a lot a lot of uh, like interesting people and um i go back to, after my education i went back to vietnam and kick off the first ever um open source event uh, in the in the country that was in 2009 and then after this uh, event I, I gained a lot of connection meet more people and um, started my um, a small company um, that doing like software development and then thing going on and on um, after many years of bringing people together there are more 
projects coming out of the Force Asia uh, network. And then I also like make it official, founded the Force Asia organization, registered in Singapore, and we started to do more things, collaborate with more people. Yeah. Wow, I love that story. Thank you for sharing that in more detail. Let's uh, let's turn to Francois's question. Um, he asks in the chat, it, it seems as if you receive many potential projects, is there some sort of a rubric or a process that you use to decide which to support? So that actually, so he's got two questions, that's that's the first, so we'll, we'll start with that one. How, how do you select from among the projects that come across your doorstep? Yes, so um, most of the project on Force Asia now actually coming from very like like close uh, contributors and low connection with the Force Asia. They've been around for a long time, but the process how we we select. So the first thing is the project must come with a committed at least like one or, or even better two committed maintainers you know to in order to um to continue to 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 get uh, to give to get feedback and to maintain and to guide the um the new contributors so so the first very important um criteria is, is like the project not only want to pass to us to, to to do thing ourselves but but there must be a commitment from existing maintainers uh, of that project yeah and then there are cost like all the criteria for instance if this is something that um interesting for for our community so you talk about technologies right so different um area around the world people have their their interests um and especially for the younger group of um uh, of community so what kind of technology people in this part of the world care about these days but I, so I can say one thing that not so many people are really like into PHP. So if you have a project written in PHP, maybe you don't receive a lot of contribution compared to a project, let's say written in React, for example, or, or another like more uh, popular languages, Golang or, or Rust. Yeah, so we need to see like if we have the interest from our community and um, at the same time, like we have a committee of uh, a few members who review um, the application and discuss if this is something that we think that makes sense for, for our community. Yeah, so it's not really a, um, a complicated process, it's just really lightweight, but it's more about if we see that the project bring in value and, and if we can see that there is a strong commitment from, from the maintainers, then we would really like, likely to, to onboard that project. Yeah. Thanks. I want to drill in a tiny bit more, um, and I would love to hear if there are specific criteria that demonstrate value for your community. So as you as you think about, you know, so having uh, having a strong maintainer presence is really important. Delivering value to your communities is really important. But how do you how do you define that value? How do you uh, how do you think about the the level of that value for each project that comes through the door? Okay, so um, of course we do not have a like how how do you say scientific way of measurement, right? But a few things that we can say. So if you roll out any like product uh, to the market, if there is a demand for that product in the market, if there is the needs for that product, what kind of problems will the projects of um, in the communities? Is there any like similar projects out there that doing the same thing? So it's more about like access the needs and and the and the side of the problems that the solution or the project come in and of course um we are not always 100 percent right or correct on, on on the way we on our thinking and our assessment of the environment but um uh, like evaluate the needs and, and, and the problems um, being solved by that projects is one of the criteria and we have like not only one person but a few people in the committee that they could make a decision together yeah thank you francois has a second question and uh, this is one that, that i was wondering about myself as well uh, he remarked on your very large community foss asia's very large community and he asks how do you manage all of these connections and communities and i, I find myself wondering whether the way in which you manage them earlier in your career is the same as the way you do it now or whether your approach has evolved over time? 
Yeah, in the beginning, there was only two people, <laughs> but now it's getting bigger. I, I wouldn't say that we we has a very large. Uh, I don't think that we we are very large. So if you look at the the Asian population <laughs> of, of population, so we continue to to grow, but not. Um, I wouldn't say that it's it is a very large community, but certainly it's more difficult to manage. Like just a few people now, we have over thirty thousand on our network, and we have like. 4,000 contributors on our GitHub. Not everyone active, but we have like every day new people join our um, uh, uh, network, right? So basically, um, in each country and in each uh, region, we have um, how do I say that we have we have we, we, we have a leader. So for instance, for for Vietnam, we have a group of um, of community leaders who manage activities within within the country. And it, we even have like people from South uh, and the North and for Thailand, we have another um, like a group of people who runs the activities. And often not only like because for Asia, like we have the leader, but we also work with the local. There are many other like local user group that willing to to collaborate and work with us so we like use john force so we don't have to bootstrap or, or do everything ourselves so our mission is sometimes in the open source communities you also see the sense of um competition yeah so uh different projects like I wouldn't say fight, but also like aim for the same donors, the same source of funding, and sometimes they have like some clash of um, collaboration. But we believe that by working together, we can grow faster. So we rely a lot on on other like communities within the ecosystem that have to promote our our mission. So how do we manage the connection? We we openly working together with people. Don't don't treat them like our competitors, but treat them like friends. Uh, we combine the force and organize the activities together in these um, different uh, regions. And we have also our force Asia advocates in like various uh, places around um, um, uh, Asia to have to to manage the activities. That's great. Thank you. Let me um, let me turn to a question about uh, barriers and challenges. So I'm, I'm curious what kinds of challenges you've encountered in introducing open source to universities and also to uh, uh, educational communities that are outside universities, uh, you know, uh, secondary education and others. So I'm curious, you know, what what have the, what have been the challenges introducing open source to those various uh, kinds of educational situations, and how have you overcome those? Yeah. So, um, so the the thing is, if you, um, I also like want to talk about. Uh, Currently, like for many years, we've been talking to Skill Future Singapore, which is the organization that foster higher education and upskilling for, um, for for their workforce. Yeah, so we talked to them already for a long time, uh, to bring in the ideas. But the thing is, um, people, if you are not familiar with the concept, people always question. So, what is the value with open source, and especially like in more Asian. The, the Asian context, right? So you learn something that you want to have some kind of guarantee that you can get uh, the job, you can create the value by studying something, right? So um, so when the, the conversation often starts, why, okay, so what would really like the value, what can they get after um, after they um, they they take courses or open source courses and because open source is not official um it's not an official curricula that being pushed inside um education um sometimes it's often like more difficult to have a rule that is that there is an official recognition or, or certificate that will allow people to get the jobs in the future 
something like this. There was like challenges that we have in the past, how to prove the value and how to, how can we guarantee that, okay, by taking these courses, by participate to, um, uh, to, 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 to the open source program, you have a higher chance to get uh, like a better job in the future. And no one can guarantee this, right? So people have to, to but people need to take the first step to join and, and, and to realize themselves that there's so much value and, and benefits that they can gain from, 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 from the way how open source work and the open um, uh, like, uh, like education, open sharing of knowledge. But, but the first step about like getting people excited and curious is always like really difficult. And this is like the step that, that we need to make before people um, I support and get involved and, and and I think that it's similar um, to talk with different institutions and um, or university yeah so it's always about like the first step how, how to get people excited as we we do not have something that we can like guarantee that this is like the the way for the future however things have changed uh, in the recent year uh, as open source has become so popular and now even like very big um, uh, companies around the world also embrace like open source uh, there's so many examples um, out there not only google uh, microsoft but uh, company like daimler bosch or the like big um, uh, manufacturers and even now i'm talking again that's resemble in singapore because i'm like working in Singapore, GovTech, uh, government um, uh, like, um, also embrace like open source. So because now um, the whole ecosystem is growing, it also have us, it makes uh, it like, it's also more, uh, how do you say, more convenient for us to start the conversation with the institution. And this is um, an advantage for us. That's great, I love that. Um, let me let me ask you uh, a little bit more about students. So I'm curious if you could tell us a bit more about how how you actually partner with with institutions with universities to organize student projects to promote student projects to help them be successful. Yeah, so um, I can give um, uh, some example. So normally, like um, there are two way of uh, collaboration. So either you go from top down approach or you go from bottom up. So top down approach mean that you start to um, talk with the uh, like how you say the the university level like on the top, and and they they always have a. Um, a partner relationship uh, departments, it depends on even use diversity. And we talk uh, and then they will like uh, connect us with the um, uh, department of uh, computer science or department of um, uh, electronics or, 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 or IT department. And then we start uh, to talk on the level of like from the dean, from the head of the department and, and try to see if we can bring in like some of our like courses into um, into their like activities yeah and it's it, it also not and it's really hard in a way that you cannot actually push it directly into the official curricula because the, the, the official curricula can only be adjusted by the ministry level yeah so it means that you need to identify the spaces within the program that allow you to come in and promote um, like the courses or offer some like extra courses for the students. Sometimes uh, these like when you talk to the, the the head of the department or the dean, they would allow you to come in and exchange with the student. So so they will invite you to come talk about the topic and give you some time slot within like. Um, the semester that you can, can talk to the student and this continue. So this is one way from top down. And another way is bottom up, which as I mentioned earlier. So in the Fox Asia network, because we've been around for so long, we have many like um, people who work in the um, education sector that are part of the Fox Asia community. So we have like mentors, we have contributors who are actually teachers, lecturers, professors at university. And uh, so, of course, these people, they do not control the entire department, but they teach like on the classroom level and they have like more flexibility what they want to um, the students, what they what they can bring into the classroom. And together with these like um, advocates, with the like direct 
teachers and lecturers, it's easier for us to organize things. So outside of the classroom, we can organize like hackathon, we can organize like evening workshop. And this happened very regularly um, in, in, in our network that we do something like this. So um, get uh, we can still use um, the classroom, but after after the official hour, the teachers, um, the, the lecturers, Permit to stay longer and run this workshop together with us. Yeah. And uh, the example that I shared earlier about building blocks. So, this is uh, started also by a very passionate teacher in Singapore. And then after that, uh, he empowered his student. And now it becomes the initiative completely run by the students. So, these students outside of their um, and last room hours, they organized uh, um, the activities inviting students from all the school and at the Force Asia Summit, like for the past few years, they organized uh, also the um, evening workshop, not only for students, but if anyone are welcome to join. And we also uh, we receive a lot of interest uh, from the community for the workshop as well. So, so to answer your question, two way coming from like head department, top down cross direct connection with university would take longer, and another way is to work with our community members bottom up and do like size activity outside of the classroom. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, let me ask a different kind of question. You know, one of the things that we see in North America is that when institutions seek to adopt open source technologies in the enterprise a lot of times it's useful to have a commercial partner to help them and uh greg logan from our opencast community asks a question in this vein and and he's curious whether uh whether you work with local service offerings uh that, that exists you know local companies that that, that uh, support and deploy and provision open source software uh, and if, if uh and if so, or if not, how do you encourage the, the growth and development of these companies so that there's a, a good solid ecosystem surrounding each open source software so that the adoption can really take place and can stay? Yes, so um, Force Asia also um, have an um, entity in Singapore. So we register as a company in Singapore that handles uh, such cases. And inside the Force Asia network, we do have like stack up and small and medium companies that we would recommend to um, um, uh, to institution who have this kind of needs. So, so we do have a network um, of companies that offer open source solutions. However, it I wouldn't say that it's like large enough or it's like, um, like we continue to to um, you know. To, to encourage like and to support companies, for instance, at the, at the Force Asia Summit, right? So we in, this is a showcase. We have the exhibition where we invite companies that offer open source solutions um, uh, to connect with institution, to connect with the ministry. So so this is something that we happen that happened once a year. But we of course we want to foster more of this connection. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, currently there are also um, in Europe, there are a number of funding that support like open source companies and we helping that, not helping, but we um, like advocates for these uh, organization and we we were looking forward to like have conversation with, um, um, with politician that and able to offer more like support and funding from the government level to support the role of open source uh, companies. Yeah. Well, in, in because I'm in Berlin, so I talk about Europe because in Europe, you know, it's easier to, of course, it still take a long time, but it's easier to connect and talk with politicians um, and expect to have something that happen in the next few years. Like in Asia, it's more challenging of course i cannot talk to uh, any politician in vietnam to, to 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 push this right so it must about like all the lobbying connection over there but it's more challenging but the thing that we learn if something happened in the west in the us or, or, or in europe uh, nation in asia tend to to follow example yeah 
All right, thank you. Well, so it's, it's about three minutes before the top of the hour, and I'd love to ask you one final question to, to close out this really fun conversation. Um, and before I do, I just want to say thank you for being here with us this hour. Your, your joy and your excitement around open source comes through really strongly, and it's really inspiring to hear you talk about your organization and, and your mission and to talk about it in such a joyful and uh, an exuberant way. So thank you for being here for us today. So my last, my question for you is this, as you look ahead for FOSS Asia in the next three years, in the next five years, what are your aspirations for the organization? Yes, so I um, want to, um, like, you know, that for the, we have this Force Asia Academy that we wanted to, um, to roll before COVID and it's like been slowing down um, quite a bit because of um, like COVID time and current uh, economic situation. But for the next three years, I'm hoping that we can push more on the Force Asia Academy side and um, continue to um, um, to make more advancement in the open source hardware um, uh, section that we've been doing for the past few years. So, so for me, two things, Force Asia Academy and uh, open source hardware is something that um, we are looking forward to um, the future. All right, thank you so much. Well, we are we are approaching the top of the hour, so let's let's end the conversation there on that on that hopeful and exciting note. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you to Hong for inspiring us this hour, and uh, <laughs> thank you to everyone for putting up with me in, in my uh, last minute moderation of this session. So stepping in at the very last minute for uh, for uh, for my my colleague Anne Marie. So um, thank you all, and please. Join us in April for the very next Aperio Micro Conference. The topic information will be forthcoming, so watch your email inbox for some information about that topic and that date and opportunities for registration. So thanks all, and have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. Take care. Thank you, Josh. And I just want to say that excellent moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much for being here. Bye, all.